Good afternoon and welcome to the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, or STFM's fourth webinar on Precepting and Teaching Physician. My name is Tom Van Sagi and I'm STFM's Director of Online Education. Over the next couple of webinar sessions, we'll cover topics and challenges that preceptors face and demonstrate an innovative web resource that most of you are probably familiar with, Teaching Physician, which is available at teachingphysician.org. Today's webinar is titled, Tips on Direct Observation, and will be co-led by Drs. Randy Clinch and Scott Harper from Wake Forest School of Medicine. Dr. Clinch, Dr. Harper, would you like to take a minute to introduce yourselves? Hi, Tom. Sure. Um, I'll start off. This is uh, Randy Clinch. Um, so I'm a family physician here at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And um, besides seeing patients, um, I am the uh, clerkship director for the Family Medicine Clerkship. Um, I deal with the community medicine electives as well for the fourth year students. And one hat that I wear here at the medical school is um, the associate dean for accreditation. So I deal with the um, LCME accreditation issues, uh, and that'll be pertinent to some of our discussion today. Scott? Yeah, Scott. Um, Scott Harper. I'm also from Wake Forest School of Medicine. I'm currently an assistant professor here in the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, I have fellowship training in geriatrics, and as a result, I do some of my education around geriatrics. Um, and over the last year, I've also had the uh, good fortune to serve as an assistant clerkship director with Randy here in the department. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Clinch and Dr. Harper. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute. Um, so today's webinar will really focus on, on how you as a preceptor can better monitor and coach medical students and how the teaching physician web resource can uh, play a part in that process. At the conclusion of the webinar, um, we will be happy to take questions. If you have questions at any time, uh, feel free to type them into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and uh, I'll try to flag um, uh, Randy or Scott with, with your question, but we'll definitely have a time allotted at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So the, the webinar today is also being recorded and will also be available on the STFM website, which is www.stfm.org. Um, go to the right side of the home page and click on the Precepting Webinar Recordings and Future Webinars link to take you to a complete inventory of webinars in this series. Um, and finally, um, this webinar, as well as the, the next two, were, are also available for continuing medical education credits. And when you receive your evaluation, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar, uh, there will be more information in that about how you can claim uh, this, uh, this, this webinar today for, for your CME credit. So with that, Dr. Harper, Dr. Clinch, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Tom. So um, Scott and I have worked together now for a while in a, in a variety of capacities. I've known Scott since he was an intern in our program here, and I've, um, I, I feel like I have the good fortune of working with him over the past year, uh, helping to steer the, the clerkship. So we're going to try to make this more of a conversation uh, about this topic. Um, and uh, since, since the folks who have been willing to participate in this webinar today, or if you're listening to this in an archive fashion, um, have, a, have at least a passing interest in direct observation, um, we almost feel like we're preaching a little bit to the choir, um, but we're going to try to get the choir on the same page today. Um, so uh, let me turn it over to Scott just to go over a little bit about our learning objectives. Yes, thanks, Randy. The good news is we're excited about preaching to this specific choir. Um, so the next slide uh, details our learning objectives. Um, but essentially, we'd like to impart to you the importance of and uh, benefits of um, participating in direct observation with your learners. We're going to give you some tips on how to begin incorporating direct observation uh, into whatever setting you practice in, which we imagine is quite busy. And lastly, we'd like to identify a couple of web resources, including teachingphysicians.org, uh, that you can learn additional information about direct observation. Sounds good. So um, in this setting, with this webinar, we, we can't see a show of hands. So what I'd like to do, um, just to learn a, a little bit about our audience, um, is I'm going to launch a three brief polls should take just a few seconds to answer. And um, since direct observation is a means to an end, so we do this observation with the intent of eventually giving some feedback, I'd like to know who is your particular audience um, uh, for which you, you deliver feedback. So here's a, a little poll. You should see a, a screen now um, where you can click on and respond to some answers. Um, so we'll find out you know, do you, do you primarily deal with medical students, residents, faculty, other learners? 
and we'll, we'll use the term learners throughout this presentation because this information is applicable across a broad range of learners. Um, so it looks like we've got um, several folks. We've only had it open for about uh, 26 seconds. 73% <laughs> of you have voted so far. That's wonderful. Um, I'll keep it open for a few more seconds just to uh, allow folks to finish up their polling. It looks like uh, as we look at American Idol style polling, uh, we've got a horse race going on between teaching medical students and teaching residents. And the, the folks who are uh, primary feedback audiences, residences, uh, are winning out at the moment. But it's, uh, it's getting a little closer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and close the poll. We've got about 80% um, of you guys have, 87% uh, or so have voted at, the, at this point in time. Um, let me just run through the other polls real briefly. Um, so the next poll is, um, and, and be honest, so what percent of your time is spent um, in direct observation of medical students? Now, I know your primary feedback audience might not be medical students, but answer this one. If you, you work with medical students in a clinical setting, um, what do you think the, the actual amount of time that you're directly observing them um, in their clinical performance? Um, and, and again, we, you know, we're, we're, not, uh, um, we're not monitoring who you are, who you answer. If you're, if you're viewing this as a group, um, go ahead and take the pulse of the group and give an answer. Um, so I'll go ahead and keep this open for a, a few more seconds here. We're only going to be directly observing the results, not judging. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. So we got uh, close to three quarters of you guys have voted. And I'm going to go ahead and close out this poll at the moment here. There we go. It looks like we've got a good trend going. Excellent. All right. And then the last poll is very similar, but it would be um, when dealing with residents. Again, kind of honestly, what, what amount of time do you feel is spent doing direct observation of your residents? <clears throat> Again, even if your primary um, audience is dealing with faculty, or if you, if you at all teach residents in a clinical setting, inpatient, outpatient, uh, lay in your eyes directly on their skills, what do you think? And then, what we'll do is go back over these few slides just to give you, share with you these data um, just so we get a sense of the, of the, the group and the performances uh, overall. All right, we got about just about 80% of you guys have voted already so far. I think you're getting quicker. So I'm going to go ahead and close these out. There we go. And now what I'll do is I'm going to back up um, these slides. Let me get this back here to the first poll. I'm going to look at what your responses were. So medical students as the primary feedback audience, that was about 38% of you. Residents, about 54%. Faculty, about 8%. So that's the, your, your total responses. So we have a you know, few more folks that deal primarily with residents in the audience. So it's good to know. Um, when it comes to the uh, amount of time that you feel you spend in direct observation of medical students, 53% of you honestly said, probably less than 10% of the time. And 47% uh, said between um, the 10 to 20% of the time. So no one answered anything above about 20% of the time. That's, that's very interesting. And as you'll see, it's probably very um, consistent with yeah. the literature that's out there. So uh, what's happening. yeah. So now on the resident side of things, um, and we'll talk about how easy or hard it is to directly observe residents, 53% of you said, probably less than 10% of the time you do direct observation. Um, there were 20% each in the other two categories, 10 to 20% and 21 to 50%. 7% um, said that they spend more than 75% of the time uh, in direct observation of residents. So it would be interesting to find out that, that um, slice of the, uh, of the audience. But we have, we have kind of limited interaction at the moment. But, uh, so at least this gives us a sense of the wide, the vast majority, 53%, less than 10% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, OK. So, now, so we have a sense now, the pulse of the, 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 this topic, um, you know, uh, who you're teaching. Uh, how about if we go over just what is this that we're talking about, Scott? What is this direct observation stuff? Sure, Andy. Uh, br briefly, it's essentially deliberately, uh, carefully and purposefully watching and listening to a learner 
as they work through either an entire patient encounter or what we'll um, talk about in greater detail later, um, a portion of a patient encounter. And the good news is, or the news we hope to communicate to you, is that we think these are skills that you already have um, because you need to be a good observer to be a good clinician and a good teacher and to do the roles that you already have in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, and because we think it's important, Randy, are you willing to talk a little bit about um, why we should be working on direct observation of our learners? Yeah, so as we know, in, in all of our learners, there's a variety of skills that they have to acquire, um, that they have to perform, that they have to demonstrate. So uh, we, we need to directly observe these skills. Um, we need to be able to give them specific feedback on the behaviors that we've observed related to these various clinical skills um, so that they can then reach the targets that they're aiming for. Maybe their institution has goals, but without directly observing them, it's going to be difficult for us to give them feedback on those goals. Um, some you know, important institutions feel that direct observation is a, a critical part of what you do in residency, the ACGME, or in medical school, the LCME. So they all have very specific uh, standards related to directly observing your learners. Um, and finally, your learners are going to be um, ambassadors of your programs. So when you have someone that launches from your medical school, your residency program, and you put your seal of approval on them, you want to make sure that you've observed them performing and being a competent, caring, fully functioning professional, right? Um, so those are some of the reasons why we do it. What about, um, you know, kind of like if we don't do it? So what, what, are, what are some things that we have to worry about? And, and as we lead into this, how about what's the example of what you've seen over the years as a typical precepting experience, Scott, with, with medical students? Sure. Um, it, it's interesting because not only do I hear this from uh, the students, but I also experienced it as a student and as a resident that um, frequently what is asked of learners is that they go in and see a patient by themselves. Um, usually it's somebody that's been identified as a quote-unquote good patient for a student um, and they're asked to go evaluate them and then return to present the case to the preceptor. Um, once the preceptor hears the story and clarifies some information, usually they go back in and repeats and clarifies some information with the patient before wrapping up the visit. That's right. That's right. So, and I hear that all the time. I ask in orientation every month when we have our clerkship students there, um, what is your typical experience with, feed, with um, uh, precepting? And that far and away is this, the, the common experience that they have. Um, so, so I'd like to describe a bit of an analogy. Um, and, and the way I tend to think about it is that of an expensive tennis coach. Um, so, so you didn't know it, Scott, but you are a, a star tennis player. And uh, you've, you've come through a great high school career in tennis. You've done a great college career in tennis. You are now at a point getting ready to um, compete at the US Open. And, and you've sought me out as your high-priced tennis coach. Um, and so you come to me, and, and you want some training to get ready for the US Open. So basically, what I'm going to do is tell you, um, you know, there's a guy out there, there's a practice partner who's out on, on uh, court number three. And what I'd like you to do is go out there, practice with him, your skills for about maybe 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, you know, really do a good job, and then I want you to come back and, and we'll talk about it. So let's let's transition. Go ahead and, and, and head out there to court three. All right, I'm gonna go do it. All right. So fast forward the clock. It's been about now 30 minutes. <laughs> Scott comes back. You know. So what what do, you, what do you have to say, Scott? Well, unfortunately, the player on court three uh, refused to see me. Ah. Refused to play with me. He ah. only wants to see the coach. Oh man. All right. Well, well, unfortunately, so so he didn't want to play. But but here, go out on on court number four, do the same thing, and I'll, I'll see you back in 10 or 15 minutes. All right, better luck this time. So we'll fast forward, and here, here Scott comes back to tell me about it. All right, well, this, this went much better. The person was very interested in playing with me. Um, was, I think, about 30 or 32 years old, left-handed, mm -hmm. uh, had a good um, uh, forearm, but kind of a weak backhand, mm -hmm. and I think when I was playing against him, my serve's really great. Um, and after our match, I really felt like I had a good sense of his weaknesses and my strengths. Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, just as your coach, Scott, I, I think I've, I've figured out the weaknesses of this practice partner for you. Um, and, and just from what you're telling me, I think when, when you swing your backhand, I think you have to step in it a little bit lower and deeper. Um, you may actually have to toss on your serve a couple inches higher. All right? um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back out on court, court number four. I'm going to finish up the match with that guy, and I just want you to watch what's going on. All right? So if we could pause there for a minute. I know that's a little bit facetious. However, um, our elite tennis players 
typically would not stand for a coach like that, right? That, that would just not be somebody that you would pay for. Um, however, our elite medical professionals, our medical students, our residents, are often put in a position where that mirrors their experience during clinical education. And unfortunately, we do not have the luxury of being the one-on-one -on -one coach that we might like to be because of our busy schedules and things like that. Um, but what we want to do is at least um, equip you with some tools and skills that can basically avoid that as being the norm. Because what happens if we don't do the feedback? Well, if you keep that elite tennis coach in mind, how are you really able to give them structured, behavior-specific feedback on their skills and their performance? So in reality, we discussed this before, what, what could you give the student feedback on when they come out of the room after having seen a patient by themselves? What, what can you actually give them feedback on? It's, it, it, essentially, you're only giving them feedback on their skills at presenting clinical information. Right. And, and divested from any of their actual patient interaction exactly. skills. Exactly. And, and this is probably obvious to folks in this audience, but just wanted to make it crystal clear that you know, we extrapolate when we evaluate the students based on their interpersonal skills, often of case presentation, um, and maybe we challenge them about the case so we assess their case-based knowledge, but we haven't necessarily seen their skills in other facets of the clinical domain. Um, so if we can't give them feedback, they miss the mark, they miss their goals, they're not going to be advancing in their skill set. Um, and the other thing is that, and it's been shown in the studies that, you know, if, if a learner does not feel like you adequately understand their skill set, they are going to tune out your feedback. Um, and the shame is that if they get that more often than not, that they just decide that, you know, the feedback from these people doesn't really take into account my actual skill set, if you happen to do direct observation and you do a great job and you give them some good feedback and, and they don't like your feedback, they're going to discount it because they'll think, this feedback I'm just hearing from this person is so aberrant from my usual feedback, this cannot possibly be true. Right. So we have to set up a culture of directly observing, giving feedback, behavior specific, so they don't tune out the, the blah, blah, blah. So Now unfortunately, the elephant in the room that we're talking about is, you know, how often is some of this feedback done? And as we could see with our polls um, uh, that, that we, this audience addressed, you know, we had a, a fewer than 10% oftentimes for the medical students and for the residents, um, or maybe at the most between 10 and 20% of folks saying that they directly observed. Um, the National Board of Medical Examiners, back in 2003, um, did a survey of medical students, and they said, you know, about 20% of students reported being observed by a faculty member zero to two times while performing a history or physical. This was field work that they had done prior to them instituting the USMLE Step 2 Clinical Skills Exam. So they wanted to get a sense of um, this need for more direct observation. So they, as you know, they've incorporated that into, into medical schools. Um, but that was 2003. I thought, you know, really. But again, with our, our audience's polls, we are right around that same amount where maybe the direct observation. Yeah. Sure. And then um, the, the, I looked at the AAMC graduate questionnaire. And for folks maybe who aren't familiar with that, um, so the AAMC every year surveys graduated medical students. And across the country, usually about 13,000 folks, uh, medical student graduates, are responding. And I said, well, let's just look at uh, family medicine clerkship responses. Um, and what I did was average the, the responses from 2009 to 2013. And about 75% of students on the family medicine clerkship across the country say that they agree or strongly agree that a faculty member observed and taken a history. That sounds pretty good. Um, there were some folks that were neutral in their responses, but then about 16% said, no, we disagree or strongly disagree that a faculty member observed us. So again, across the country, on average, since 2009 to 2013, we're probably matching up with the amount of direct observation that, that even the folks on this uh, webinar are agreeing that that's about what they do, mm -hmm. right? Um, the good news is that in the 2003 survey, there was a slight uptick by one or two percentage points of the students that agreed that they got some direct observation and a slight downtick in the folks that disagreed. So maybe that's just a chance variation, but at least it's slightly encouraging that this year there's a... There's maybe a, taking place more. Yeah, a little bit more of a movement. Um, 
And again, why, why do we care? This is a, a National Board of Medical Examiners survey that um, assessed medical students, uh, residents, chief residents, and fellows, and they asked them about direct observation. And what they found was when a person was directly observed, the, the person's perception of do you, the observer, have an accurate knowledge of my performance was, was very positive. So if you do direct observation, the learner feels like you accurately reflect their performance. Um, and uh, you were also more strongly associated with giving feedback if you were somebody doing direct observation. Um, interestingly, the best was maybe about that 75% of folks um, felt that uh, you accurately reflected their performance if you directly observed them. So there still is a cadre of learners who say, even if you directly observed me, 25% of folks thought, I don't think you accurately reflect my performance. So I know there's something other than just direct observation. Direct observation without feedback, without some good teaching, uh, is, is empty. So it's a, it's a means to an end, mm -hmm. right? So so that's our that's our kind of the the good, the bad, and the ugly about some of the direct observation stuff. Um, here's the the reference, and I'll give you at the end uh, uh, just as a side. We have a study guide that will be posted um, when the webinar is posted on the Teaching Physician website and STFM website probably by tomorrow. So there's a study guide that will include these slides and some topics or questions for review and reflection and the references will be on there as well. So we alluded to some benefits, Scott. What, what might be some additional benefits of direct observation? Sure, I, I think this might be another um, case that we're talking to a group that already considers these things, if you're interested enough to check out a webinar on direct observation. Uh, but to be um, granular about some of them, I think it's an important skill to become familiar with your learner's baseline um, skill set, basically. They're how comfortable are they with patients, how are they in patient care and knowledge base? Um, how do they do with communicating uh, various portions of wrap-up session? Um, and if we then provide some uh, evaluative feedback or, or provide some teaching, that, and again, direct to observe, maybe we can see if they've had um, improvement in those behaviors that we observed. I think another thing that is good about direct observation is that it conveys that you're interested in and that you care about the learner that you have with you. I think it can feel more personal for the observer that you have directly observed them. Um, you're also able to, in the process of directly observing, um, point out to uh, the, the learner, be it the student or the resident, that a visit is subdivided into several different categories. Um, and an example that we'll go into a little bit more in the um, further into this talk is that you can directly observe a single portion of the visits, such as this next time I'm going to observe you performing an agenda setting piece of the visit. Mm -hmm. And not only does that allow you to see that, but it also identifies for the learner that agenda setting is its own skill set. Right, right. Um, and also it's a good chance, um, to, other than taking history, to do the same type of practice with physical exam pieces. Uh, I'm going to observe you performing a neuro exam. Uh, is, is, is another good example. Sounds good. Well, the folks um, who have not seen Teaching Physician, I'm going to go ahead and, and change to Teaching Physician um, website at this point in time. Um, so I'm already logged in, and, and part of the dual benefit we hope for these webinars is to give you um, information about a topic related to precepting, such as direct observation, as well as a bit of a guided tour of the Teaching Physician website, because it's such a rich resource um, that it may be uh, daunting to know how to start using this resource. But I think once you learn the lay of the land, it'll become more familiar. You'll be able to go back to it to reinforce some of these topics. So basically, this is as if I've just logged into the teachingphysician.org website. Um, and uh, so my name's up there as the login. This is the screen, the preceptor resources screen that it typically defaults to. And you'll see in this blue bar a bunch of um, terms, and those are subsections on the website that have got great different topics for preceptors. So preparing your practice, teaching strategies, the webinar done last month was on giving feedback, so there's information that will reinforce that. And where we'll go today is under the evaluating learners section. So you can get there from clicking on this highlighted link, 
or any of the um, headings below it on this main page will also take you directly to that section of the website. So if we click Evaluating Learners, it will go to that section. Now, briefly, the, the layout of this uh, page is three columns. Once you get familiar with that, each page is set up about the same way. Um, so in the center, whatever topic you're looking at, like Evaluating Learners, has some brief readable material. So if you have something just before you have to give some evaluation to a learner, you say, you know, I just want to update that. I, I know we have a session coming up. You can quickly look at this. Um, on the right-hand side, there are extra resources and links that will open up in a new window so you don't lose your place. Um, and there might be articles. There might be um, PowerPoint presentations. There might be videos to review. So a variety of things that you can use. And then on the far left, there are these buttons and you'll see the one that we'll go to today for direct observation. So if we click this link for direct observation, in the center, um, you'll see the content that uh, Scott was just reviewing. So if later on you want to review some of the benefits of direct observation, these are some of those benefits that are listed in the center here. Um, and then since some of the terms that might be used, uh, you know, that are listed under applications of direct observation, Maybe we use different educational terms from institution to institution. Um, Scott was going to just review or highlight some of those areas under the applications of direct observation. Sure. If you, if you look in the center of the screen now under the section that says distinguish specific parts of an encounter, um, this is sort of what I was hinting at earlier. As opposed to opening, usually I'll um, couch this in terms of agenda setting with the, uh, with the learners that I have, uh, introducing themselves and obtaining an agenda and setting an agenda for the visit. Um, as opposed to elicitation of presenting problem, that sort of falls a little bit under agenda setting and also getting a thorough history of present illness. Um, and the final one, I think I use a little bit different terminology um, when, when addressing my learners is the closure piece. Um, and I think even there you probably could subdivide a little bit, um, but, but wrap up is a term that I'll use. Um, presenting the patient with uh, a, a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis and a plan and then providing some education and, um, and advice about when to follow up and so forth. Right, right. So, so it might be just different terms. You might think about them in different ways. But if you wanted to review some of these things, um, this will help you later on try to apply some of these aspects of direct observation. After the webinar, if you say, you know, I just don't have time to listen through that whole webinar again. I want to go to some bulleted points. This is your local resource right here on Teaching Physician. And you'll notice some resources over here. I'll just click on a couple of them. Um, so this article, Direct Observation, What Is It and How to Effectively Perform It, will open up in a separate tab or in a new window, depending upon your browser. Um, and this is a nice article that focuses on uh, direct observation in residency, and it goes over some steps, so about five or six different steps you might apply um, to integrating direct observation with the residents, and we'll talk about some of those issues today as well. Um, and then. Uh, there's a form that is um, provided here. This is a form that was created several years ago as part of a, a preceptor education project workbook. Um, and you'll see that uh, you know, this might allow you to just print something off and capture um, some of your skills of your learners, information gathering, information communication, uh, student-patient relationship, different domains of an encounter like Scott was saying. And you might be able to then um, categorize how well they're doing in these different domains and give them feedback on it later. So there's just you know, tools that you can go to. Um, on the video library, the last thing I want to highlight, um, there isn't anything that specifically says direct observation. Oops, I guess it's, uh, I must have timed out on that, so let me go back to my main screen. So there isn't anything that I have to show you that says specifically direct observation. However, um, there is one that says preceptor intervenes to correct a clinical mistake. And so this preceptor is in the room with the student observing them, performing a physical exam, and very supportively intervenes and shows the student how to do something. So if you are uh, directly observing their physical exam skills, again, it's with the intent of providing some instruction or feedback. Um, so that's, that's the part of the teaching physician that is uh, covering direct observation. So I just wanted to highlight that. So with all of the potential um, positives that we talked about, Scott, what do you think some of the concerns might be of a given preceptor when it comes to integrating direct observation? Sure. Um, and I know it's it, the case for me as well that um, in the setting of a busy clinic and um, given our collective desires to be good at a number of different roles, uh, including providing good patient care, including pro 
being productive in a clinic uh, and including providing teaching to the learners with you, um, it's, it's easy to be concerned that your um, attention and um, your, the needs would be pulled in more than one direction. Um, and as a result, um, too, you can, it's, you can be concerned that direct observation would take more time than you have to give it because you have all these other um, stresses and, and um, requests on your time during clinic. That's exactly right. And, and it may be one other piece of paper, one other form, like I just introduced a, a form that maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't. Um, so some preceptors say, not more paperwork, please. Or, you know, I'm not really sure how to use this form when I'm seeing someone. Um, some people might have an even more sophisticated question about, well, if I use this form, does this form have any validity? Uh, if, I, if I use this to help observe my learner and then give them feedback, has this been shown to be effective over time? So those are a lot of concerns and questions, but the good news is we should be able to address those concerns and give you tools during the remainder of this talk so that you can feel confident that you can um, apply some of these skills and there are some tools that are, are useful. So to that end, um, I just want to highlight before we go into the, the tips that besides Teaching Physician, so we've been to that site, there are some additional tools and resources that you might be able to use to help you with direct observation and other precepting issues. Um, so the, I mentioned the Preceptor Education Project number two. Um, so this Preceptor Education Project, or PEP2, is a publication um, through the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine Bookstore, so the STFM Bookstore. Uh, the link is there. I won't go to it right this second. Um, but uh, you can purchase this facilitator's workbook. It's a nice um, spiral bound, or uh, three ring binder basically, um, and it has everything that you would need to run workshops on the different modules of um, things that a preceptor does. Direct observation, feedback, teaching, handling challenging learners. Those are all individual workshop modules, and it's really a just add water kind of resource. So it, they, they give you a bit of a script as to o how to open up, how much time to spend on each section. Um, you see what the participant workbook text would be right next to what your facilitator's text should be. And there are separate workbooks for your participants that you can purchase. I found this particularly useful as I was becoming familiar with direct observation. Yep, yep. And it, it's, it's very readable, very easy to use. Uh, and so if you have a burning passion and, and at your institution, you want to be the one that runs a workshop on precepting skills. You can purchase this PEP2 facilitator's manual and whatever appropriate number of, of participant workbooks. Um, you can review some of these things, get together with a group of people, and, and you know, in a faculty meeting, um, you might take uh, you know, 30 to 40 minutes or so and run one of these sessions. Or in a residency program, if you have grand rounds, you might want to run one of these workshops. You can do two or three together and do a half-day session if you like. Um, so that's for the, the, the folks with initiative and wants to do it on their own at their own institution. For the folks who say, I'm not sure if we've got that comfort level. I don't know if I have the time to be able to devote to that. How about can we bring somebody in? So the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine has their on-the-road workshops. And I want to link out to that for the moment. Um, so STFM on the road takes folks with expertise in these different areas and a variety of others, and you can kind of craft your three-hour or six-hour workshop. So a lot of these sessions are, are done at the annual meetings or the medical student educator conferences or others, um, but you can bring folks to you, and it may be more cost-effective to do it that way. Um, there's a nice topic list, and so you'll see that there's a variety of things, including teaching skills, um, sessions that are described that you can have, um, feedback and assessment, and including one on direct observation, just like we're doing today, and then other things, evidence-based medicine, career development, scholarly activities, writing skills. So you can pick and choose the three or six hour workshop that you would like. Um, and so that's just another option of a way to get uh, preceptor education uh, at your institution. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a shout out and a, and a plus for our American Board of Internal Medicine folks. Um, probably back in the mid-1970s, they created this form that would be uh, useful for evaluating people uh, directly um, in a clinical experience. And it was for residents. And they call it the mini CEX, the mini clinical evaluation exercise. Um, and basically, their form is something I'm going to zoom in on here to show you a little bit about it. The form is something that is useful um, for students and for residents. It was created primarily for residents. 
So if you notice, they have the, you can check what year it's in. Um, their website gives you good detail about settings that it would be appropriate or best to use this in, ways to incorporate it, uh, the scale, but it's fairly brief. You gather a little bit of data about the patient you're seeing, what's your focus on today for the learner. Again, it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to do all of this in one sitting. Um, and then you can capture information about the, the learner's interviewing skills, physical exam, professionalism, clinical judgment, counseling, efficiency in organization, their overall clinical competence, and then you jot down you know, how much time did this take, how much time did I do feedback after the session, um, and then your satisfaction, the resident satisfaction, this is something that you can put in their residency file. So this is just a tool that you could use with students or residents um, that has been well validated over the years, plenty of research on it, it's been around for a long time. So if you wanted to use something as a tool, the American Board of Internal Medicine's website says this is freely available, um, but I'm waiting to get, to get confirmation if you need to be a member of the ABIM in order to obtain it for free. Um, and when we get that answer, we'll post that in the, uh, if we can, in the follow-up email um, to participants. So we'll go back to the, this section here, and, and let's go ahead and jump into um, some of the tips. And, uh, and Scott was going to go ahead and just introduce the idea of some of these things again, these tips for direct observation. Yeah, good. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get more specific, but as a most basic idea, uh, we think that, um, that the audience and, in general, teachers of family medicine already possess the skills you need to, to do direct observation and to do it well. Um, and that's because you have to be a good um, observer to be a clinician, to be a teacher, um, to do a whole lot of things in your life. Um, the, the thing that's sort of bad news um, is that you're probably too good at this. As it stands, um, it is very easy to um, make a snap judgment based on uh, your observations, your experience, um, all of the things that sort of you incorporate to, to come up with a general idea of what's going on um, during a patient encounter, and you no longer um, go through the step-by-step -step process of identifying the observations that you've made and realizing that those specific observations are what have led you to the conclusion that you've come up with. And um, we're going to come. I was going to just go over one specific example of that, which is um, something that Randy and I have talked about um, with, with kids. Uh, if you're seeing a child in the office. It's very easy to, to walk in the room and within a, within a few seconds of going into the room, identifying that this is or is not a quote unquote sick kid. Um, for instance, somebody that has a classically, classically croupy cough but is running around the room and smiling and active, you would um, quickly um, come up with the conclusion that this is not a sick child, not someone that needs to be hospitalized, whereas you, you may not um, take a step-by-step -step consideration of well, that child is smiling, that child is um, making tears when he mm -hmm. cries, right. um, the, all the little tiny pieces that made up to that, um, made up to that conclusion. And along those same lines, um, when you are observing medical students, we would ask that when you're considering direct observation to begin um, to consider the specific behaviors that you're observing as opposed to making judgments about those behaviors. Um, and as an example of that, we we considered a couple things, but including uh, if you if you are observing a abdominal exam, for for instance, and um, your general sense is that this was a bad abdominal exam, what we would ask that you not do is say that's the worst abdominal exam I've ever seen, and instead um, be specific about what you observed. I saw you perform an, an abdominal exam. I noted that you started by pressing on the right lower quadrant where the patient is having their most pain and that seemed to make the patient tense up. Um, and that would also allow you to provide some very specific feedback, such as, next time I'd recommend that you first auscultate the abdomen before you do any palpation. And when you palpate, um, consider starting at a portion of the abdomen that's not tender uh, to allow the patient to become at ease with the exam that you're about to perform. So that's a really good example and a good way of kind of leading into the feedback that spawns from your direct observation. And it's, it's just being intentional about knowing what you're looking at, knowing what you want to tell the person, telling them in a way that will help them advance professionally in their skill set. Right? Yeah. So instead of, and, and unfortunately, 
we, we tend to cringe when we think of someone having to give us feedback because usually we can remember those examples of the bad feedback, like that's the worst abdominal exam I've ever seen, right? So we, we, we just hope that uh, if, you, if you have a sense that you have some um, need to enhance your skill set on feedback, I would certainly go ahead and view the, the webinar that we did last time on feedback, so that might help you out. Another, um, another example along those same lines that I've found um, as I've tried to incorporate it into my interactions with learners has been beneficial is um, just observing the learner's um, body positioning, their, their kind of overall approach to the patient interaction. And instead of um, saying to the, to the learner, you, you look closed off, instead describing what you observed. I, I, I saw you sitting back in your chair. I observed that your leg was crossed over the other and your arms were folded in front of your chest. Uh, these are specific behaviors that is easier and, and more palatable for the learner to take in and maybe change in the future. Mm -hmm. So in the remaining time, we might go over some of those actual tips of things to, to integrate with both students and residents. So some of the tips. So say if we've got a, a medical student. So we'll, we'll go into students first, because we might find ourselves in front of a student in our clinic more often, unfortunately, than we are in front of a resident. Sure. Um, and so, so putting this up, this purposefully observing certain aspects, and the key words here are certain aspects of the interaction. Um, what I have to do is go in a room with a student, and it's going to be a busy clinic, you know that. Um, so I go in the room not with the intent of giving a global assessment of that student's performance in that encounter, um, but instead I want to I look at certain things, like you mentioned, maybe their physical exam performance this visit, that's what this visit's about. Maybe their uh, review of systems this visit, something like that. So, so take it that you can do snippets of things, maybe over the course of a morning I will have seen the student do the equivalent of a complete history and physical with different aspects of the visit on different patients. That's my goal. Um, so when I'm working with a student in a clinic, um, it doesn't take much for me to get behind, but if it's the first patient of the day and maybe I'm not already behind, I will go ahead and go in the room with the student side by side, introduce them, and we'll have, we'll have discussed maybe a little bit about what they're going to cover, but I'll let them gather the HPI for either the main concern or just a given concern and I can do some documenting, but I'm looking at their body language, their rapport skills, how they're organizing the HPI, um, and, and they know when to turn the baton back over to me. When they're done with the domains of the HPI, they don't even have to go into a complete review of systems or even a focused review of systems. They know this is what he expects right now, and then they're going to pass that back over to me. I'm going to run with your idea of the, uh, the first patient of the day to, to talk about um, starting a clinic where you have a learner. And I think it's a really important idea to uh, pre-game, uh, which is take as many as 10 minutes, um, or as few as 10 minutes, I guess I should say, to speak with your learner about which uh, specific behaviors you're hoping to uh, observe, uh, both from uh, the, the teacher's perspective. I, I would like to have a chance to observe you perform a review of systems or perform an abdominal exam, et cetera, and to get a sense um, from the learner which pieces they would like to be observed doing. Maybe they haven't until that time had a chance to do a wrap-up with a patient and be observed doing that um, and figuring out what their goals are and making it so that you can watch that piece uh, can be very useful. Mm -hmm. um, and one skill set to practice to come, become more familiar with observation and hopefully also bring the learner in uh, to your corner, so to speak, is to be observed. Um, and one thing that I think is good is to say to the student, in this next interaction, I would like you to observe how I obtain or use systems related to the presenting problem or how I um, go over their medications in a way that's meaningful and clarifies their understanding of how they take them. And then as you step out of that interaction, have the um, learner tell you what they saw. Right. And, and you, know, you can choose. It's your, your job to choose. Uh, you pick the patients, you know the patients that might be considered you know, folks that you can't stop talking, so you know the ones that you just do or don't want to interface with the student with. Um, but you choose what you want to observe, and, and um, you and the student can select um, the, the topics for observation. Um, so how about, I, I've got some colleagues that say during an annual physical or a complete physical exam, health maintenance exam, 
too much is going on. I feel like the student might get overwhelmed. Maybe the uh, patient's bringing in some chronic illness issues on top of their health maintenance issues. So sometimes they just avoid having a student interface in one of these rich exams. What I'll try and do is um, that's a perfect uh, opportunity for the student to say, let me go over these focused health maintenance issues with this person. So the idea of pre-gaming, I try to have the student email me the night before and say, what are some of the topics that are coming in? Or if we look at the schedule coming up the next day, it looks like Mrs. Jones is coming in for a physical. She's 57 years old. I'd like you to be thinking about her immunization needs, her cancer screening needs, what risk factors she might have, or preventive medications like aspirin, vitamin D. And so I'll turn the interview over to the student after I've made sure that this is not going to run awry and allow them to go into those details. The other thing I find about that is if the student's in the room during the history gathering and, and taking some history themselves, the patients are much more likely to allow them to interact with them on the physical, even if it's sensitive exam components like a breast exam or pelvic exam, hernia check, prostate exam. Sometimes the students say, you know, this is the first time I've had an opportunity to do a prostate exam or a hernia check. But it's because there's more face time with the student in the room with the patient. And Randy, I think this, this to me is one of the places where direct observation is a little bit freeing. It, it kind of um, allays some of your internal discomfort about time considerations because you don't have to have the student obtain all this information and then you in turn get the information from the student. Instead, you, you are there um, watching them obtain this information, also hearing the information and able to clarify any questions at that time. Exactly. Just like our, our expert tennis coach example gone awry, um, the, the most efficient use of your time is not generally the student going in this black box room by themselves, gathering a history in who knows what fashion and doing an exam that we can't give them feedback on, and then coming out and presenting things to us outside of the room. Um, so we'll, there'll be another um, webinar about integrating learners into your clinic coming up next. So just as a segue to that, but, um, uh, but so this is a, a skill set that does free you up a little bit, and you're now giving the student more feedback on something they actually did, which raises that, that percentage of students who could say, I actually had a faculty member who observed me <laughs> taking some elements of a history or of a physical. And uh, as a next piece, we were, just wanted to talk briefly about um, how to involve the student at, at the end of the visit, at the um, wrap-up piece. Um, which can also be somewhat difficult. And I find one of the biggest stresses on, on that part of the portion of the visit is if you and the student have both been in for the entirety of the interaction, and you as the um, clinician have decided what the diagnosis is or the differential diagnosis and what the plan will be, um, sometimes you haven't had an opportunity to um, provide that information to your, to your student. And so it may not be totally fair to ask them to get that information. Uh, two, two things that I've tried to do to get past that is um, one, if you know before the visit what some piece of anticipatory guidance is going to be. Um, this is a patient that's coming in uh, for blood pressure follow-up and have some chance to talk about what type of blood pressure um, anticipatory guidance they're going to need to give them about if the medication caused side effects, what dietary considerations and so forth. Um, or if you've both been in for the history and physical portion of the exam and you have a brief moment to step out. Um, for instance, um, in our clinic we, we print out and provide to our patients little paper after visit summaries. And in the few moments that I've stepped out of the room to get this document off the printer, I'll, I'll say to the student, so this is what I'd like to talk to the um, patient about. I'm going to let you do the portion about um, when they need to follow up if their infection isn't improving or if they're having side effects from the antibiotic that we're giving them, uh, et cetera. That's a great use of time. And, and as you know, efficiently using our time um, and, and incorporating these skills is really what will make them work trying to say, gosh, I've got to give a global assessment of every encounter every time the student's in there, it just makes you feel overwhelmed. So I think that's a great example. Um, let, let's think about the residents, since a good number of you guys are dealing specifically with residents as well. So in general, the type and the context of your precepting will really drive what you can and can't do with your residents. And as we mentioned before, we often find ourselves in the room with the student because they're our patients more frequently than we're in the room with the residents especially in an outpatient setting. Maybe it's a little easier to do it in an inpatient setting, but often when your intern's pre-round, you're not seeing them doing their physicals, you're hearing them talk about things, and then you do your physical afterwards. Um, so it really depends on, do you have several residents to precept? Are they 
third year residents with full schedules? Are they interns in the beginning of the year with a few patients? Do you have available video monitoring in your, um, in your clinic? So if you do, you might be able to watch several things at once, and this would be a relatively straightforward way of incorporating some direct observation. Um, how about the one-on-one -on -one teaching clinic? Um, Scott and I were talking about those clinics are often reserved for the, the challenging resident, you know, um, whereas it really should be considered something that could be offered to anybody. Um, and it, it's, it is more that elite medical professional, so that's your chance to be that one-on-one -on -one coach. What if you just don't have the time for that? We'll talk about that in a minute, but um, even in a low-tech fashion, just like with the medical student at the beginning of the day, before things start to get hectic, maybe you can look at a given resident, maybe you could have them anticipate that you'd like to be in and observe some aspect of their visit. Um, this, the resident would have to prep the patient, and, and a common way of saying it might be, um, hey, you know, my supervisor might join us for a part of this visit, he'd like to um, see me in action, and uh, so he may give me some feedback later on about it, is that okay? So just kind of preface things with the patient so that they know someone else might be knocking and, and joining in. But if you do that at the beginning of a clinic session at least once, um, like if, if I'm not going to have more than four residents, at least that gives me a chance during a precepting session to have directly observed one resident in some aspect of things as opposed to just the typical, can you come in and look at this rash? <laughs> that's, a, that's a common one. So. Um, in another version of the pregame that I find to be such a useful skill, um, which is a little bit different for resident precepting than it is for having a student in your, in your clinic, like Randy was mentioning, I think it's useful to look over the schedules of the residents that you're going to be working with, of, of the three or four residents that are going to be precepting to you that day, um, and identify patients that might have specific portions of the visit that you would like to see. For instance, if a patient was coming in with a chief complaint of headache, and you had not had the chance to directly observe that resident perform a neurologic exam before, that might be a great opportunity. Um, similarly, if somebody was coming in with um, a foot ulcer, I mean, and you wanted to, to see them evaluate an ulcer, or if they, they were coming in with a shoulder complaint and you wanted to observe a musculoskeletal exam, these are all things that you can identify ahead of time and discuss with the resident that you would like to be notified when they're going to go in and do that portion of the visit. Um, and, and interestingly, even if it is that person that you have been asked to come in and check out a rash, um, we, we think it's a good idea to consider sticking around for the wrap-up. That will give you a chance um, that's not outside of your usual activities to watch for a few minutes as the resident um, delivers our impression of their diagnosis and the plan going forward and be able to provide much more specific feedback about that portion of the visit. Right. And, and using some sort of structured evaluation form like that mini CEX form that we talked about that has the most field experience behind it and validity is probably a good idea um, so that you have something to capture your, your observation on and give them feedback on later. Um, so what if you just can't do that? You say, we're, we're precepting, there's just too much going on, an individual preceptor can't do it. A lot of programs have individual advisors for their residents. And you may be able, as that resident's advisor, to schedule a time where you can look at your schedule and their schedule and pick a given patient and do a single encounter. So you can use that mini CEX form, the resident can prep the patient to expect you might be coming, and maybe you can find the time to meet, observe one encounter, and repeat it every six months. Mm -hmm. That would be lovely. I mean, at least start small, <laughs> see if you could do that once or twice a year. Um, you know, just even working that in can be a big thing, and it's more some than what they currently potentially would be getting on observation of their clinical skills. Um, since the mini CEX form shows good validity of picking up a person's progress over time, six or eight encounters is actually ideal uh, to be able to say, no, this resident is not advancing clinically, or they're not doing so well, or yeah, they're progressing. So if you're able to build to two per quarter, that would be great, but just start small. Consider doing something. That was really uh, taken by that idea as we prepared this talk um, and recognized that when I give my feedback to my advisee, it's primarily based on evaluations that I had nothing to, to do with. So I've already scheduled some time to directly observe my advisees. I'm looking forward awesome. to it. That's we're going to walk the talk, right? right? So let's wrap up. I know we covered a lot. We want to save a few minutes for some questions. So just in summary. Uh, first, we think it's important that you, that you do it, that you um, practice direct observation. That's really, like so many other things, the best way to become comfortable with it. Um, and that secondly, um, as we alluded to earlier, you're, you want to avoid making a judgment or at least 
identify for the learner how you came to that judgment. Which specific behaviors did you observe and um, some description of what you observed. Right. And, and a driving home point for me is that idea of specific components or facets of the patient encounter. Just pick something so that over the course of the day or the session or the precepting session, you can give them some feedback on something you directly observed. And then the resources like Teaching Physician, the STFM Preceptor Education Project, uh, the pre STFM on the Road, using that uh, mini CEX form, those resources are available to you. Use them to enhance your skills and just continue your application of direct observation. So I think that's it from our perspective. Tom, if you have uh, any questions that have come in, uh, we'll be happy to, to try and field those. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Fantastic job. Um, so we had one question come in during the course of the webinar about cost of teaching position. So I'll, I thought I would just kind of address that quickly. Um, teaching position is, is available uh, for $800 uh, per year for up to 20 preceptors and $1,900 per year for unlimited preceptor use. Um, all you need to do is go to uh, the, uh, the teachingphysician.org which is uh, where you can kind of learn about the different subscription types and uh, other kinds of uh, subscription kinds of questions. So um, that's that. Um, I don't know if there are other kinds of questions that, that you have. So far, I don't have any others showing up. So uh, we do have um, a couple of minutes. Randy or Scott, I don't know if you have any other closing comments or anything else you want to mention before we close it out. Now, right now, I think you know it might be that because people were tuned in to this topic, um, you know, that they do get the sense of importance of this. Um, I think in, in preparing this topic, it just struck me um, across the years since like 2003 up to now, and even with our own audience's reports, that um, you know, the amount of time that we're able to perform direct observation of our learners is very small and very precious. Um, and may be limited because we don't have that mindset of using snippets of the encounter to give them some feedback and direct observation on. Um, so if we can adopt that mindset and try to work it in a little bit at a time, I think we're going to start to move that needle on. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is it's the, it's the perception of the learner that you are directly observing them. So make it clear that I'm going to be observing you, I'm going to be giving you feedback on this aspect of this encounter, and then do it. Don't have a missed opportunity where you directly observe them, but then you didn't give them a chance to give feedback. So, um, so definitely do that. Um, I, I guess lastly, what I noticed with the, the studies that are out there uh, is that it's typically going to be self-report information. So it's going to be, unless somebody in the audience decides to do a study that involves you know, videotaping an entire day of precepting, everybody, and then finding out how many quantitative examples of direct observation occurred, it's always going to be a survey of a learner who says, I was observed this frequently or this infrequently. Um, I feel like the person understood my, my skill set. Um, I feel like they had a good knowledge of my skill set. Um, I feel like I'm confident in my performance of these skills based upon my observation. It's always going to be a survey because we just don't typically have the mechanism to do research where you audio tape or videotape the entire precepting encounter. You know? um, so I just want to throw that out there. People sometimes wonder about you know, self-reported data. That's probably about the best we can do in this setting. That's all I've got. Yeah. yeah I was just going to reiterate that first point that, that Randy uh, made or just made in his last wrap-up, uh, which is that uh, as I consider direct observation, the times when it feels daunting is if you think about directly observing an entire patient interaction that's very time consuming and you can see how that might interrupt a otherwise busy clinic but once you can view it as sort of parceling this out and maybe um, accumulating an entire visit by, by observing a history and a review of systems and a medication history and a physical each in piece um, it seems much more doable um, and also can more easily fit into the framework of your clinic. And I think your learner can receive that feedback more easily as opposed to just a flood of information about one encounter. Yes. Right. And I, I will say that uh, I'm not so far away from being a learner that uh, I don't remember vividly some of the times when I was directly observed. And, uh, and it's a meaningful, you know, it's a very powerful, meaningful tool. Um, having to perform a neuro exam uh, on rounds in the hospital in front of the team is, uh, it'll stick with you. And I learned it very quickly. <laughs> that's right. All right, Tom, that's all we've got.
Well, very good. Um, we, we don't have any other questions, so we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Clinch and Dr. Harper. You both did a, a great job in, in packing a lot of information into uh, the last hour, and I think it was done in a really interesting and entertaining way. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that. Uh, but thank, thanks to everybody out there for joining us uh, today on this, on this topic. Um, again, at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll receive an evaluation in your email inbox of the webinar. So we'd love for you to take a minute or two to uh, complete it and electronically return it to us so we can learn more about how we can better deliver information through, uh, through webinars.